All right. There will be bourbon. There will be eggnog as well. Got that going on. I got uh, Mr. Ross Kennedy in me with, I can't even speak, in with me here tonight. He's the huntsman on the old X app Twitter, as you uh, formerly knew it. Uh, how you doing tonight, brother? Man, I'm good. It's uh, any excuse to drink bourbon, you know, drink bourbon, talk to cool people. I'm all about it. That's the right answer right there. Uh, and so before we do that, as always, tonight's discussion will be fueled by the finest Native American spirits, which is bourbon. And of course, also eggnog, which I don't know if that originated in America or not. Probably not. But we're going to drink some of that as well. But from the bourbon aspect, we got the Old Taylor, two Buffalo Trace products tonight. So we got Old Taylor, right? So if those who don't know what that is, that is uh, it's kind of the entry. It used to be a four-year actual age-stated bourbon before, you know, the Buffalo Trace distillery. Everything in their stock has gone into ridiculous amounts of uh, demand. So the age statement's been removed. There is some four-year bourbon in it. What the uh, overall age statement is, who knows? It's not on there. But this is the precursor to Colonel Taylor. So if you like some Colonel Taylor bourbon, this is where it all starts. This is the uh, the youngest of that. Uh, and then also, we got the eggnog. The eggnog wars are uh, underway. I don't know what side you're on, but uh, I'm team eggnog. And we got a little benchmark eight eggnog, which is also benchmark eight is a Buffalo Trace product. So that's what we got going on tonight. I saw your glass before we started recording. What are you, what are you imbibing with, my friend? Starting with the uh, Four Roses single barrel and then... Uh... If I uh, kill too much of that or decide I don't want to blow through $50 worth of bourbon in one sitting, I'll uh, switch to the Ezra Brooks 99. So that's kind of one of my go-tos for okay. yeah. fashions and other mixed drinks. Ezra Brooks, that's highly underrated. A lot of people, see, that's the thing. This is kind of what I was talking about. Everyone's just like, oh, they got to get something because of Buffalo Trace, because of the whole, like, the, the Pappy and the Weller and all that other stuff that's stemmed from it. But they're ignoring all this other stuff that's just absolutely delicious, readily available, and under 20 bucks. It's amazing. I uh, Ezra 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 ninety nine uh, Heaven Hills uh, bottled in bond yep. the, uh, the white bottle. Yep. Um, love those. And and honestly, man, if I'm just grabbing something off the shelf just because I'm making a quick and dirty you know cocktail or something like that, Benchmark's fantastic. So it is. Um, speaking of uh, the Heaven Hill stuff, have you ever seen this one? They don't really sell it outside of the state of Kentucky. The uh, you can order it because it goes to certain liquor stores, but. Uh, Heaven Hill makes this one. Quality House. I have had that. I love it. I love it. It's like, it's like 13 bucks. You drink this stuff it's, all day. It's delicious. It's amazing. Right. Although you, you you and I are both old enough to remember a uh, a Buffalo Trace pre-Rogan era where you could get Eagle Rare for 30 bucks. You could get... Yeah. That wasn't that know, long ago. No, it was like a year or two ago. And, <laughs> and now if you can find Buffalo Trace, it's 40. Eagle Rare is like 70. It's just out of yeah. hand. I mean, they're great great bourbons but th there are so many that you know if i'm grabbing a 30 dollar bottle off the shelf if i can find it i love still austin um okay. that stuff's fantastic it's readily available in the midwest um kind of slowly creeping its way out of texas but um you know it's it's the, the diversity of, of american whiskeys and bourbons that are available now and yeah you know it's uh Templeton Rye is still one if I really hate myself that day and, and I want to have a you know like just an absolute bitching <laughs> day the next day. Uh you know, I'll, I'll grab some Templeton Rye, but um, you know, that 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 was one of my first really and and still remains one of my favorites. So it's so you go back to the stuff that you used to see like Eagle Rare, right? And that was never really a big thing. And now it's like here in Virginia, since it's a state run thing, that's like part of their limited release, which is kind of funny, like you were saying, because you know, I spent the last seven years in California where you used to go in the BevMo and Eagle Rare is in, or in Total Wine, even the same thing. It's there for 30 bucks. Yeah. Like said. Um, Rock Hill Farms would be there 50 bucks. Now you you won't find that. And then my favorite. It's all an allocation. Favorite, yeah. My favorite Stag Jr. Right. Which is. Um, yeah, I love it. Well, I used to be able to, I still remember Nugget is the, 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 kind of like an upscale food store out there. Uh, kind of like a whole mm -hmm. But I think it's better. Um, but they used to have Nugget just sitting on the or uh, Stag Junior on the shelf as recently as twenty one. Yeah, for seventy, which is a little over. But and then I remember doing a a, a drive up to Oregon. Um, this was twenty twenty. This was like right before the shutdown, so this was February. And there's a liquor store called the Eighth Wonder of the World, and they used, Stag Junior's just sitting on the shelf for fifty bucks. What? Yeah, and I bought the three bottles that were there. 
And I got two of them still up there sitting because they're in my little bunker now because I just, you can't find it. And I'm not spending $300 on it. Dude, it's amazing. Like it's, it's, I'm in a couple of those, like, you know, I don't get on Facebook very often, but prior yeah. to me, like not being on Facebook, I was in a couple of those like bourbon trading groups and yep. such a great indicator for like what the secondary market is for all this stuff. And I was stunned. I was in DC uh, a couple weeks ago. And well, let me know uh, next time. I'll, I'll be out there in two weeks. So I'll All hit right. you up. There we go. <laughs> um, yeah. I gotta, I gotta come to the Hill and, and argue with people about things they don't know about, but think they do. Right. Oh, um, nice. That's, that's kind of everyday, but, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And, and the, 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 the client I was with was just insistent that we all, cause they were in town too. And they, they just insisted we had to stay at the Willard, uh, you know, the intercontinental there. Yeah. And uh, so we went, we, we went to the round robin, the bar they got, I'm looking at the selections of bourbon and then I shit you not, there's a bottle of Pappy Van Winkle sitting up there. And uh, like the bartender saw me lock eyes with it, you know, and he's like, do you want some Pappy? And I'm like, no, I'm not paying for freaking Pappy at, at a intercontinental hotel bar. <laughs> and, uh, but one of the guys that was with me saw it at the same time. And he goes, yeah, he said, you know, three doubles of Pappy. I'm like, well, fuck you, man, you're about to drop like $300 on, you know, six ounces of bourbon. Yeah. So, <laughs> But it was uh it was good it was good certainly no complaints but you know it's just and, so and now I, tequila mes- yeah tequila prices are now getting to where like bourbon was like oh really see i don't tequila. that's crazy too i love tequila but um you know it used to be there were some there were some like great anejo style tequilas you could get for 25 30 bucks a bottle that are now 50 60 70 because all the celebrities are getting into it and making yeah tequilas and, yeah it's uh <laughs> It's, it's, it's funny you say that day, because, yeah. um, you know, there's a ton of DC bars with good selections. The prices usually oh, suck, yeah. right? Like Jack Rose is a big one, right? Everyone wants to go to that one. And the prices are, for their individual pours, they're not good. Uh, they do make a great old fashioned. A great old no fashioned is probably like 16, 17. Oh, yeah. that, that's delicious. Um, but I was just out in Hamilton, which is probably about maybe an hour outside of mm-hmm. DC, right? And, uh, some random sports bar I went into and stag juniors there 16 bucks a shot. So here we go. And I was like, that's as it should be right. It's nothing that needs to be, you know, with an extra digit in the fucking price tag. Um, But one of the things I will say that was great about being in Napa is every bar, every restaurant, even like pizza shops that had bars would have the entire Pappy lineup for the most part, maybe not the 23 with most and they usually had decent prices. Um, Cole's Chop House that I would love going to in downtown Napa, they 20 year for, I think, 75 a shot or something, which is, I mean, that's the, you're not going to really see it. Much better. Yeah. yeah. You're not going to see it much better than that. Now, that was last year. I remember that was specifically this time last year because I was celebrating this, this job thing. But yeah, um, it, it is kind of silly how the prices have gone. And I, I did go to the Buffalo Trace Distillery about two years ago, uh, Christmas yeah. time, and they were doing. They were talking about their big expansion, which is going to essentially, hopefully, double their production over the next X right years. But my question to them was always like, you have the actual the grounds and the distillery and the the, the individual storehouses that all have unique materials and climates and all in it, so. I know you're expanding and on the other side of this little hill here and putting all this stuff up there and doing all these new age. Yeah, it's amazing. How are you going to recreate the flavor profiles, right? Of something like Blanton's, for example, that ages in the, what is it? Warehouse H, I think, which is like a the brick. It is. Right. So I'm like, yeah, you're doubling your production and that may help with supply, but is that going to be the same product? Because it's not going to be aged. I don't don't think it will. Like I, I tried to convince them I was there march of last year and uh i tried to convince them to let me like you know go up to those and i'm like i'm a logistics and supply chain guy man i'm a total nerd (laughs) for this kind of stuff and and uh they were like no and i'm like well which guy do i you know which guy will take 50 bucks to walk me up there and they're like no (laughs) and uh but but i really wanted to see you know it's 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 um you know it's a combination of those those buildings and yeah. humidity temperature control the water in the area like it's all of that is what comes together to make that taste profile not just the mash bill yep and uh you know it's it's you know but four roses is still probably my favorite distillery to go to just because it's it's got this really kind of like uh yeah it's it's i think it's really old school character about it and and you know it's clear that it was like built in two phases they had like the original and then they stopped making it for a long time and yeah then they, exactly they, yeah 
you know, they're bringing it back on, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, I've done the bourbon trail and it is, it's just, uh, the, there's so much history on that. And I love I know, it. And, it's, yeah. it's, it's, and they're not really close is. to each other, which is great too. Cause you, you have to actually yeah, people think it's like an hour time. apart. It's like, no, yeah. you got to cover like half the state. Exactly. You want to do the yeah. whole thing. <laughs> yeah. And you, and it's not like, which I've seen some people do some crazy stuff in terms of the wineries out in that, but it's not like a winery tour, right. Where you, you know, California limits what they can serve you. Whereas, you know, Kentucky, you, you end up at three distilleries in a day. You are wrecked. You know, it's, absolutely. It's, it's I mean, not they're, they're giving you, you know, like you go to Woodford or. That's where I want to go. Now. Woodford yeah. and Wild Turkey are my next. Woodford's two. cool. It's, yeah. it's, it's really neat. They've put a lot of money into it and it's, it's, you know, it's a little bougie compared to, you know, some of the others, but it's, <laughs> uh, it's, it's a, it's a tremendous experience. And, but yeah, you go to three or four of those in a day and you're getting those flights that, you know, are, are essentially three quarter ounce fours, but you're getting four kinds at every place. And it's like, you better hope to God you've got like a driver. So yeah. when we did that, we actually like me and the guys I was with, we, we like actually got a livery service to take care of us for two days. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Cause you that do kind of need it. it. Yeah. You do, you do absolutely need it. Um, all right. So you have a ton of stuff. I, I went down the rabbit hole kind of on your, 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 sorry. No, <laughs> on the, on the X accounts, Twitter, whatever, we're going to keep calling it. Um, so there's yeah. a series of stuff I want to kind of ask you about that you have up there, like your pin section. Before I do that though, I want to mm -hmm. kind of like, how did you, like, what's the, what is your background kind of, and how did you get into where you're at? Is, have you always been in like logistics supply stuff or what? Yeah. So, uh, graduated college in the early 2000s and um, I kind of fell into logistics accidentally. I was uh, working at a uh, one of the big uh, uh, grain and food processing companies in the U.S. and got hired as a merchandiser. And I was like, man, this is going to be like trading places. It's going to be awesome. We're talking about pork bellies and, and corn and frozen orange juice concentrate. And it, man, it sucked. I, I hated it. And my brain's just not oriented towards like sales or towards the merchandising game. And uh, we were shorthanded one day at the grain elevator in the middle of harvest, and they sent me out to um, uh, load a train. And it was like I had I had the low man job, you know, like low man in an oil field. Uh, yeah. That was what I had, and that was strap a harness on and get on top of the train and actually make sure everything's going in properly. It's dirty work; nobody likes it. But I fell in love, and um, you know, from there, uh, bridge pretty quickly after that harvest into. Uh, doing uh, international container exports for, for grain. Um, so that's one of the main ways the ocean carriers actually get some sort of paying backhaul freight back to Asia, typically, um, you know, out of the U.S. as they load these containers up, you know, 58,000 pounds of, of corn or soybeans or, um, right. you know, distillers, dried grains or solubles, stuff that just goes for animal feed or human consumption. And, yeah. Um, I got thrown right into the fire. They were, they were undermanned there too. And, and, uh, I was doing like three jobs, none of which I was at all qualified to do, uh, but, you know, but I loved it. It was like, you know, 12, 14 hour days for months and it was an amazing experience and I was hooked. So, um, and then round about, uh, you know, fast forward to probably 2009, I guess it was now 2010, something like that. Um, I tapped on the shoulder through just my network, uh, you know, family and friends type of thing. Of uh, I got brought in with some other logistics uh, subject matter experts or perceived subject matter experts to work on some projects for State Department, and uh, kind of the rest was history. So I've been a bit of a two hat guy kind of for most yeah. of my career. Where um, you know, I live in the commercial world, but as necessary, um, you know, my brain or my ability to operate logistics shipments or do analysis or whatever. Um, you know, periodically results in contract work and things like that. So, uh, gotten to see a bit of the world, which is really cool. Yeah. It. Um, but, uh, that's all really accelerated since about 2016, 2017 with, uh, Trump coming in and China really beginning to move into some of the next phases of their, uh, hybrid warfare concepts, gray zone, you know, everything as a weapon type of deal. And, uh, one of the main ways that, that they do that is through Belt and Road, through dual use infrastructure, maritime aviation assets. And that's just kind of purpose built to what I was already a little bit trained for by life and by career choice. So um, it's it's only been a rocket ship from there as far as um, access to information, 
uh, Uncle Sam needing someone that kind of understands both worlds. There's not a lot of people yeah. that kind of have lived in both concurrently. Um, so it's been, and it's been an interesting ride. You know, I get to see a lot, of, I get to see a lot of really cool things that I can't talk about, but it also yeah. informs yeah. insights on things I can talk about and, and adds value to both domains. So that's been, for me, um, the great joy and the great cynicism maker, if you will, is getting to participate in things that matter, but also seeing in a lot of ways how the system has kind of begun eating its best and spitting them out. And, you know, the incentives are not aligned towards um, smart folks, the folks who get it, whatever staying, you know, in DOD, in the intelligence community, in State Department, Department of Commerce, all of that. The incentives are aligned towards them getting out and monetizing their skills and access. And that's left us with a bit of a brain drain that's been filled with all these, you know, highly credentialed, you know, midwits that think certain things are a good idea uh, when they're not. And so it's a little demoralizing, but it just, you know, it fuels the fire to be able to, you know, participate in things that do actually make tangible change. So, so long answer to a short question. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you kind of hit on, you kind of led into what I was going to ask you about first. Um, sure. So you mentioned China and you you have a thread posted here on how China became the manufacturing engine of the world. Um, yeah. Walk us through that. How, I know you, I think you put down, what was it? The eighties is when something kind of 87, mm -hmm. I think something. Okay. And then yep. things really sped so, up. Uh, yeah. So uh, after chairman Mao died in the seventies, there was a, a power struggle for kind of what the soul of the communist party would be in which, you know, which faction would represent that. And and one of the, you know, well-known in some circles, but not necessarily in public circles is the, the, the communist party of China is not this monolithic entity. Yep. Uh, the Chinese government is not a monolithic entity. It has its own governmental apparatus that operates at the, at the local and the province and even the national level. Um, and, and that's not necessarily the CPC or CCP, depending. You know, I, I tend to say CPC just because that's how they call themselves. But um, within that, you, you know, imagine if basically you had a normal bureaucratic state in the United States, but one of the political parties ruled over all of it where not everybody is a part of that party, but they still have to be responsive to it. And that's, that's the situation you have there. Complicating the matters is that the People's Liberation Army, the PLA, is, is functionally its own independent organ uh, operating in this. And, and since Mao, and, and really even under Mao, the PLA and CPC have kind of been separate groups, if you will, um, that operate with their own business interests, their own regulatory political interests. Uh, under Xi Jinping, it's the first time we've seen that 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 consolidation of power into one figurehead who kind of figuratively rules over all of these domains rather than there being this warfare between them. Uh, but Deng Xiaoping was who uh, came to power in, in, in the post-Mao era, and he really took to heart in a lot of ways, and I can't remember if it was Stalin or if it was Lenin or whomever, but the, the famous quote out of Soviet Russia that, you know, will sell the capitalists the rope with which they'll hang themselves. Mm -hmm. And what he, ex what he exploited was a gap in how capitalism works in the West, which is the, the pursuit of profit ahead of national ends or ideology. And that was, all right, bring your businesses here. Um, you know, we mean no harm. Uh, we have looser regulations, the labor's cheaper. And this whole model built up around that kind of gradually in the 80s and then at the end of the 80s and the early 90s exploded into the way Harvard and Yale and Stanford and Penn and all these big law schools were teaching their their future business leaders of America that outsourcing is the way. And at that point that, you know, basically the drug dealer got us hooked on our own supply. And uh, that, that became the model for economic and, 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 and revenue growth in the West. Uh, for 30 something years. And by that, by the time we realized, you know, what we were actually giving up, it was too late. Um, so that began first with uh, manufacturing chemicals, things that have significant negative environmental outputs that are owned uh, or have worker safety issues. So OSHA, and EPA, yeah. and all these things yeah. that make it difficult and expensive in the U.S. Well, just send it to China and, you know, have them make it and import it and so everybody wins. The trade-off for us is we thought 
that by making China more capitalist, that we would actually, um, you know, sort of bend the arc of communism away from uh, being antithetical to the West to and, and to what we do and how we live, make them more like us. All it really did was we locked ourselves in a cage and gave them the key uh, to let ourselves out. So that's uh, uh, once the infrastructure in particular built up around that, the ocean carriers, the systems of finance, the law, once all of that built up around China as the manufacturing hub of the world, they were 19 to 20 percent of everything made in the world is made in China. And it's, it's too Crazy. late at that point. So now we're faced with this choice of kind of being at the mercy, if you will, of the hostage taker. And then what do we bring back to the U.S.? How do we do it without collapsing whole segments of our economy? And that's that's the leverage point they have. So we're, we're two global powers, we're two hyper powers in different ways um, where they hold a lot of the cards on manufacturing, economic production, means of logistics and transportation. We hold a lot of the cards in that much of the economic power of the world because the world's economy is still pegged to the dollar. And, and so we've kind of got a gun to each other's head. You know, it's like the scene of Reservoir Dogs where everybody's got their guns pointed at each other. <laughs> and uh, nobody wants to be the guy, you know, with, with uh, Steelers wheel playing, getting their ear cut off. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's, that's really the geopolitical calculus of play here. And uh, it's, it's so, dangerous times. It's yeah. Times. Well, so, okay. There's a lot to go on there, right? Um, sure. So when you hear, because this is essentially... When I heard it, I, okay, we got to make America great again, right? So let's bring all these manufacturing and jobs back. And then Biden essentially says the same thing. He just rebrands it to build back better. Um, mm -hmm. Have I, ha, Has any of that happened other than the last eight years? Well, I mean, almost seven years? Arguably, uh, yeah. some of it has. Um, you know, the, big, the biggest fight is not capital. Uh, the biggest fight is not... Uh, even the laws and regulations, although that's focused on pretty extensively, the biggest fight is the political will to support the companies that do take that risk, that do try to um, go a different route and, and try to reshore. Um, we have to be able to support those companies. So CHIPS Act was um, a yeah. hybrid effort of a lot of entities within the administrations uh, and the private sector to bring semiconductor manufacturing yeah. back and man i applaud that effort and you know we're we're struggling to get out of our own way with it but that's kind of the american way you know churchill said it best he's like the americans will try everything uh wrong and, and until they're left with no option but to get it right but they always get it right and that's been the story of, of all of this but everything from pharmaceutical manufacturing to uh, food production, particularly on the protein side, um, our energy industry, all of these things, we still have these critical dependencies that we haven't addressed. And, and we have to begin moving towards doing that um, faster than we have been. So let's go to the, 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 the global power thing that we, we say, right? Because sure. <clears throat> Now, I, I've, I just, you know, and you've, you've been here, so you know that, I mean, there's so many different types of people or that are in the DC area or Nova or whatever you want to call it. A lot of Chinese, obviously as well. Um, and I, I've struck up conversations with people in bars or, you know, just come in contact with them through work or whatever. But um, one of the things I found interesting when I had a conversation, this was probably I don't know, back in March, maybe with someone who a uh, Chinese national who's lived here. Um, they're actually an American citizen now, but then they work in like corporate finance. But they tell me that we get a lot of fear mongering in our media. And, and there's a lot of people concerned with what a, like an actual confrontation militarily would look like with China. Mm -hmm. and, and their comment to me was China is way more fearful of that because people don't think that People don't know what the the average China person, China Chinese citizen is, and most of them are just rural and poor. I mean, that's a big country, right? They're over a billion people, but you know, everyone thinks, oh, well, Hong Kong, Beijing, these big major cities, but who's the actual person that lives in China? 
And do they want this conflict with the right. United States, right? Um, now we can fight and argue all you want about like <laughs> militaries at this point, right? And, and and our own makeup and our own issues. But from that aspect, and I don't know how versed you are in that, if you are at all, if not, well. right, if you are, yeah. Um, okay, then, so what does that look like to you? If, if you know, the worst possible scenario arises and we find ourselves in some sort of ground conflict with China, what does that, what does that look like? so they hold and where would it take place let's go with that right because we're still we're always the we're always the away team yeah i mean we'd be the away team in that conflict too um yeah. you know there's an old proverb of, you know never get in a land war in asia uh i think we <laughs> learned that with afghanistan <laughs> yeah. um yeah. but uh so they 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 have critical weaknesses and critical strengths and, and you have to kind of understand both to see what the state of play would be um Number one is that they are a, a still, despite you know Xi Jinping's best efforts to make them what's called a dual circulation economy, where they take the gains from the export side and then and then try to raise the the consumer capabilities essentially of the of the indigenous population, um, and then get away from being export this. But they are still export dependent. They are still dependent in a lot of ways. They they have to. Even their currency manipulation games are pegged against the dollar in some way or another. And uh, they're still dependent on the fact that the U.S. and, and Europe, but really the U.S. more than anyone, is uh, a, a consumption-driven economy. Yeah, And that's a strategic weakness for them. So they can't, without great political peril to, to, to the ruling apparatus, they can't cut off their nose to spite their face. And so that's why we see... A lot of these sort of machinations happen in the gray zone and and they're trying to essentially provoke conflict that they can control on their, you know, on their domain. Um, that's a huge weakness for them. The other is, is that any sort of conflict that happens is most likely to happen within that first island chain. So that's going to yeah. be like Japan, Taiwan, Philippines, Indonesia, yeah. kind of within those littoral and coastal waters. Um, and well, we have a pretty established presence, right? We, we do, right? Yeah. So we've got, you know, the army out of Korea, we've got significant, uh, you know, army, navy, marine corps presence uh, throughout Japan. Uh, whatever anybody says, we definitely do have advisors on the ground uh, in Taiwan. We obviously have a significant presence and growing again in the Philippines. Um, and you have countries like Vietnam and Singapore that in different ways may be uh, aligned or at least amenable to working with China that, that, also don't benefit from conflict in their, you know, in their AO or in the region. Um, but if conflict were to occur, it, it would be most likely within that. The strengths of China in that regard is that they've built, they, they, they have a blue water Navy under a technical definition. They've got carrier strike groups and whatever their carriers are vastly inferior to ours. They're based off old Soviet designs, you know, ski ramp style where they have to launch the planes off the ramp at the end versus uh, what we have with, uh, I think right now it's Reagan's there and there's one of the carrier strike group there. I can't remember off hand. Vincent, um, you know, with these modern, modernized steam catapult capabilities, we've got the Ford operating in the med that's electromagnetic launch. Um, so on a ship for ship, pound for pound basis, on a aircraft for aircraft basis, we outbox. But what they have that we don't have is a significant overwhelming arsenal um, of rockets, missiles, you know, A2AD is a term, you know, uh, anti-access area, area denial capabilities that if we get into a hot, hot conflict and it becomes highly attritive in nature, um, they've got a lot more ordnance they can throw at us than we can possibly stand off and replenish. There would be significant losses on both sides. Um, they also though, they, they do lack actual combat experience. And that, and that's the X factor. You yeah. know, the United States is a nation that really has not, not been at war right. since world war two. Yeah. Um, you know, say what you will about the Pentagon's ridiculous priorities on certain things, but we are still a nation that absolutely knows how to slug it out yeah. uh, when push comes to shove. Um, that, it becomes a question then of if they throw everything into the fight and we throw everything into the fight, who prevails? And the answer is nobody. 
yeah. in that regard. Yeah. The U.S. takes enormous losses. So does China uh, from a material standpoint, from a manpower standpoint. Um, and so that's that's the X factor that basically I think has stayed China's hand in a lot of ways with Taiwan, uh, with the provoking further conflict with South Korea, uh, with Japan. Um, I don't know how long that state of play will hold because at the end of the day, a lot of the decisions that are made to come out of China are, are predicated on the, the will to power and ego drive of a single man at Xi Jinping. Um, my gut tells me that if if you were to launch something fully kinetic and it, it just everything, you know, the red flag goes up and everything gets sporty in a hurry, um, he would be fighting actually battles on a couple of fronts. He'd be fighting the economic battle, the damage to the Chinese economy. Um, he'd have the U.S. And, and our allies throwing as much at them as we could possibly give. Um, but he would also face a lot of palace intrigue that currently is kind of low level. Nobody really wants to play their cards. Uh, but there are factions within the CPC that would love to see him fall. There are centers of power within the People's Liberation Army uh, that would love to see him fall because he's disrupted their own economic interests and business interests. So um, it would get very chaotic and complex and uncertain in a hurry. Um, I don't know that he wants that. And so I think he's been biding his time for a long time until he can control enough of those X factors. We may not be, ever be in a situation where we see that though. So th that being said, um, I mean, there's a lot of ways to read it. I think a lot of people on um, face value are a little more, I guess, confused more than anything because we hear one sure. thing out of not just this administration. I mean, we've been hearing this out of all of them for as long as I can remember, but why do we have a sitting governor of the state of California over there visiting? And then why do we have him shortly thereafter, you know, being welcomed as if he's the conquering hero in California and line the streets of San Francisco with Chinese flags? Now, don't get me wrong. I get it. There's China, Chinatown and a huge population of Chinese in San Francisco. Sure. I go there all the time for baseball games, but I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, it doesn't look it does. It's it's it's, it's not a good look. Like you don't see people lining the streets of fucking China with American flags, you know. No, just, you don't. It's 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 not a good look on on our part. I think, and it makes him. It's a PR win for him. It it, it is on balance. Now, when you kind of look at the game theory, of the whole situation, he wouldn't have come here unless there was something he needed or wanted. There's rumors right. that he needs this huge bailout. There's rumors that he he came ready with concessions to get us to back down on certain things and exchange. He'll uh, increase cooperation on certain things. But at the end of the day, um, watching the events as they unfolded is, is by and large, it was a net PR and uh, net economic and political win for Xi. Um, I do have regular communications with people in China that, that exists at, at a sub-political level. Um, their view is, is that it was an, an overture towards increased economic cooperation, which supports some of the PR went home from some of the saber rattling that's been done, uh, where people are worried about kind of what's going to happen to their jobs or their companies, whatever it may be, if, if everything goes bad. Um, I think we gave away a lot during that trip in, in exchange for, for promises that historically um, China has not lived up to fentanyl, you know, in this particular case, combating fentanyl trafficking. Yep. China knows who makes those companies. They're all heavily subsidized. Most of those companies live in, uh, you know, national and provincial level economic and technology development zones. They know exactly what they're doing. And they, they would not be uh, uh, taking the steps they're taking if they were serious about actually combating that because they could shut those down in a minute. Yep. From our side, Asking the question of why a governor of a state like California, one of our largest state level economies, I mean, hell, it'd be a, probably a top 50 global economy if it was its own country. Um, why did they go over there? Well, for the same reason that the governor of North Dakota, Doug Burgum, rolls out the red carpet for Chinese money and things like that, is that it, it serves their economic and political interests at the state level to be able to try to um, build those bridges, look like political statesmen bring money in from the outside because they're not 
clever enough to figure out how to incentivize indigenous production of you know with American companies. Um, so it's a bit of a devil's bargain where because the United States is a federal system, state level governors and secretaries of state have the ability to conduct all manner uh, of economic trade deals. That's why you see states send delegations. I've been part of those delegations for a number of reasons over the years to various foreign countries. Um, states can do an awful lot of good for themselves, but an awful lot of damage from a national security or from a yeah. political standpoint by being able to essentially negotiate as sovereigns in some contexts. And it's uh, when you see a guy like Gavin Newsom, who obviously, despite whatever lies he's saying, has high level national political ambitions. Yeah. Um, make these trips. It's it's about looking like a statesman. It's about being able to say, well, I delivered on X amount of investment coming into our state. Um, I'm solving the problems that D.C. can't kind of thing. It, it's purely self-interested. Yeah. Um, and it's it's. I don't know. It kind of makes me want to kick him in the balls, to be honest with yeah. you. So, well, let me ask anyway. you that then, because you're right. Um, and I had this conversation come up here, you know, with some people locally who've always been East Coast Democrats, and sure. um, they don't have a very favorable view of Newsom. They don't like him. They don't like the way he comes off. They don't like the way he he talks. He's not one of them, right? He's not a he's not an East Coast liberal by any means. Um, so I don't know if that's what plays into it, but, um, I can see that a lot the way, no, I look at him from a lot of different, for, from a different perspective. I, I don't like him for my own personal reasons, but I can see how, um, the good and the bad, right. Good looking dude, you know, he's young compared to what we've had the last <laughs> for a while. Now. Right. Um, uh, I actually thought he'd from what COVID was very early on in California being out there, I thought he was very transparent. And then the narrative changed very quickly. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think his style plays very well nationally, but I would reverse that by just saying, I don't think anyone cares anymore. It's just who's got the, the right letter next to their name and they're going to vote for him no matter what. I think that's the biggest part of it. Yeah. Um, Newsom, Newsom plays really well with certain demographics and, and cohorts that the Democrats are hoping they will maintain or they'll be able to pull more away from the Republican Party. So that's, uh, you know, women in particular, obviously, when you got a guy that looks like he does where, yeah. you know, he's kind of in that 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 elder, handsome man phase of Hollywood. Right. Kind of like yeah. Richard Gere, Harrison Ford were at different <laughs> points in their career. Gear, um, about that one. That's a good one. Yeah. I mean, he, he, yeah. he's got a, he's got a certain face and, and, but cynically speaking, and I think this is the truth. Um, they're counting on enough people, not giving a shit about his politics or decisions he's actually made as a governor. In the same way, I think a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways, Republicans are maybe overestimating the appeal of a guy like DeSantis who doesn't play well on camera, um, but is an extremely efficient, technically capable governor and would presumably be so in a lot of ways as a president. Um, one of them is overestimating the appeal of that type of guy. The other is, is banking on the ignorance of the American public, just saying, okay, is it a D or an R? Yeah. And particularly compelling is the comparison of him to a guy like Trump who is if nothing else not an unknown quantity in the same way newsom would be for a lot of people so there's a lot of people that just don't know better that would vote for newsom simply because he's not a guy like trump or he's not yeah. a republican yeah um i think that's that's probably the end the, the the ultimate calculus that's in play on a move like a shadow campaign for newsom going to china acting like the elder statesman um they're they're but setting the democrats it up. won't run they want they want to make the mistake of putting harris out there right yeah, no, no way. Because <laughs> if nothing else, Harris Harris doesn't play well with anybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, her her history is too well known. She's she's been too much of a bit of a dunce, if you will. Yeah. Uh, as a VP, if you notice that she very rarely appears in major media publications, and yeah, you've got a guy you, like you, Biden. Normally, the VP plays that surrogate role, and they haven't really let her play the surrogate role. No, and you would think with all the, the yeah, and you would think with you know all the I mean, just as we, I don't make fun of 
Biden, because like I said a million times, he kind of reminds me of my grandfather at the end of his life. He like some days he's on and most days he doesn't know where he's at. And I think that's what the president is, unfortunately. And yeah, you would think if you had a strong number two, you would put them out there as much as possible to build confidence. Absolutely. And yeah, that doesn't take place at all. Like, what do they what do they have her speak say? Like, she just came out to announce like this new task force on Islamophobia or something. It's like, are you guys even reading the room or we just, we're just whatever (laughs) we're just, and it's always like, it's, it's a task force. Like this is like the big three minute video that you have, you know, (laughs) trying to, to appear as if you're doing something and you announce basically another task force for what I like to call the, uh, the DC Metro MBA crowd, who is like, whatever you see, whatever poster you see hanging in the Metro for, uh, you know, the latest, masters in government these are the people who are actually running our country and where Absolutely. do they get the who teaches them government like <laughs> what is the model that they're getting their master's degree in like i'm confused at what who who should we be trying to teach these people about i don't understand at this point because it can't be us i mean if you look at i mean if you look at the history of academia um you know breitbart talked about it in his books before yeah. he passed away and um, that was I, a, I have, I'm starting to think that was a hit at this point. Like, there's no way that guy was. Just I, I, I 100% believe that. And okay. uh, it's like, it's like one sure. of my few pet conspiracy theories is, is that Breitbart knew too much. He spoke too many of the uncomfortable truths out loud that, that couldn't be said. Yep. Um, but the, big, the biggest insight that he really did reveal that was, I, in, in a lot of ways, I think the, the animating impulse of the Tea Party movement and things, because, you know, Breitbart yeah. had a lot to do with yeah, that. Yeah, I was right and, about that time, yeah. But, Bannon, Bannon kind of wrote his coattails, but um, if, if you look at something Brad Moore talked about, he talked about the influence of the Frankfurt School, which were the, the, yeah. the proto-Marxists, if you will, coming out of Germany in the 20s and 30s, and they, they transitioned over and became a part of American academic culture in the 40s and 50s, mm-hmm. which gave rise to, in a lot of ways, the hippie generation and things like yeah. that. So you're talking about now, if you look at it from almost like a genealogical or lineal perspective, the 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 radicalization has only continued as as the generations have gone on and as critical thinking has been replaced by critical theory which critical thinking is try to break something down to its constituent components and get at the right answer even if it makes you uncomfortable it's the root of the scientific method it's the root of mathematics yeah and so as we've seen these individuals talk about how um well, traditional grading systems, traditional systems of, of measuring intellect or measuring uh, student aptitude with the ACT and SAT, whatever it may be, critical theory flips that model and says, how do we undermine the system of things or the, the way things are taught or the way things are understood from a first principles perspective by attacking everything that came before as, as wrong, as uh, outmoded as whatever it may be. And once you've broken that foundation down enough, you can build something on top of it that's more to your liking. I think that's what we've seen in academia. And if nothing else, um, the, 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 the long-term pervasive influence and, and impact of the, kind of that long march of the institutions, I believe it was Gramsci that said that, of you, you build a model that, 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 is, is almost recursive in terms of keeping thinking in a closed loop and you just keep putting the same inputs back into attacking every single thing. So anytime you compromise with that thought model, it the compromise is not bringing them closer to your way of thinking or creating some sort of synthesis. It's this weaponized Hegelian dialectic of thesis, antithesis, synthesis it inverts the model and becomes problem reaction solution, right? You, you, you know, the end state you want to get to, whereas in Hegel's model or in the scientific method, you don't begin with the end in mind. You begin with what are the first principles and what, are, what's the data that we need to build off of. And then truth reveals itself by studying that model, the inverted version of that, that sort of weaponized Hegelian dialectic that we see in play across the board is we know what the end state is. That we want to get to and then how do we generate the right kind of problem to drive that reaction or that requirement to get to that end state and i think that's a lot of what we've seen and that thinking has now impacted dc and and all of these young mandarins if you will 
uh, that, that populate state and, and national political levels, they know where they want to get to. So they start creating problems and reactions that drive that requirement. And uh, it's a very dark way of thinking, but I think it's also what we have seen happen over the last 30, 40, 50 years. No, you're right. And it, it goes back to Breitbart's book where he talks about what you were just saying, but he also highlighted the fact that the left is willing to play the long game and the right does a terrible job at it. Like they don't do it at all. They just are in a constant state of reaction. They're never on offense. You know, they're never in a position to kind of forget moving the goalposts. They're never in a position to even attack them. They're constantly on defense oh, yeah. and acquiescent to whatever gets said to them. Um, so the way you ended that though, like we're looking for an end state and then trying to create issues along the way. It doesn't sound like, I keep coming back to this. I came back to this before when I talked kind of with Terry about something similar. It's like, I know they're, they're, they're of this mindset of we're the elites and we'll be insulated, but you're, you're creating the worst possible outcome for your own country. And why would they do that? Unless there's just this total lack of belief in, you know, the nationalistic aspect of it, right? Like, it's just, why Absolutely. would you want to weaken and put yourself in the, in the, in a, in a weaker position long-term? Because you're not elites or not, you're not big enough. There's not enough of you. Right. You know, we, we see what mobs can do when they want to do things. Right. And these are usually unarmed mobs, right? Maybe they burn some shit or they, but these aren't people taken to the streets with weapons that they can readily do if they wanted to. Right. So I'm just curious, like when you say stuff like you're saying, it does make a logical sense to me. But the only thing I can always take away from it or I can't seem to understand is the why. Like, why would you do that? For the same reason people like you and I in different ways chose to serve. Right. Right. Um, and, and if you're the kind of person who's raised a certain way where I was raised to believe that you do what you can for uh, your family, your community, your country, for God. Um, and however many terrible, awful ways I've fallen short in all of those things over yeah. the years, um, that's still a first principle for me that I return to as, as sort of my animating core value. And a lot of these are individuals that were raised to believe that the fundamental precepts of what it means to be an American, constitutional values, these, these, like, these first principles of human freedom, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, things like that. They've been raised to believe that they're wrong. And that's the first principle they always return to. And what's happened is, is that on the Republican side, the entire business model, and, and make no mistake, politics is a business model Yeah. Um, on both sides of the equation, right? The business model for the Republicans is being like the, the, the genteel loser. And always, so their whole business model is we always have to have this like cultural hot button issue we have to push back against. And look at look at the crazy thing that the Democrats or the liberals or whomever are doing today and donate to us and we'll help you fight for that. And it's, it's, it, they become geldings, right? Like their, their, their profit motive, their first principle is maintaining a job. The first principle is maintaining a, a lifestyle and they're willing to compromise and be like these, these pussies that don't do anything to, to like actually advance the ball in the direction of freedom or, in the direction of constitutional principles because they've they've built their entire life's economic and, and and personal motive model around continuing to make money and so this this whole like you know loyal loser effect that you see the, trump threatened all of that in a lot of ways and trump didn't do everything right like i'm no 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 I, i'm someone who's like openly you know made enemies on all sides by supporting him and at different times, yeah. you know, talking about where he's wrong, but I do still have at some level, like my own credibility for sort of calling my shots. Like I see him because there were times that Trump compromised with the swamp or with the system because he thought it would advance the ball politically and ended up backfiring in his face. And, but the times that where you've seen Trump be maximally brilliant is in, and in, in why he is such a disruptive, chaotic, uh, chaotic attractor 
you know, and, and, and the concept of, um, you know, self-organized criticality and all of that, where he disrupts the entire system is the times that his instincts lead him into doing and saying the right things, which is that we've forgotten about the average man on Main Street. We've forgotten about the average American and what they believe in. And I'm going to do something that's in alignment with them. We know it's the first principle for Trump because you can go all the way back to the 80s and 90s and look at the kind of stuff he did long before the presidency was ever even part of his like mental calculus. And he was saying these things. He was talking in 1989, 1990 about offshoring of jobs and how that's a detriment to average Americans yeah. and these types of things. And that's why at the end of the day, he's being attacked so uh, vehemently and then in some ways continues to make his own situation worse by unforced errors or, yeah. you know, he, he's his own his, worst enemy. Yeah. He is his own worst enemy. So he's like a lot of mad geniuses. I, you know, I put Elon Musk in the same category where uh, they, they advance the ball in some really interesting and critical and uh, irreplaceable ways. But in other ways they can't, they can't kind of stop stepping on their own dick about stuff because they just, yeah. they don't, they, they, they don't know how to operate in a political sense of tuning the message, depending on the audience, whatever it may be, and their own instincts, while brilliant, also occasionally lead them into pretty big traps that are easy to set. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I don't know that Trump is the savior for this. I think we're going to have to see a period of more American decline in probably 2028, most likely, is where we actually begin to see some sort of tangible progress uh, pushing back against the insanity. Um, or we end up seeing a right-wing dictator emerge and, and kind of all bets are off at that point for the American experiment. So, um, but I will never bet against America on the long haul. And I, I do think we'll eventually get it right. But, you know, like I said earlier, Churchill said it, you know, count on America, or paraphrasing, but count on America to do everything wrong until they finally are left with nothing to do but get it right. Yeah, well, I mean, the only thing that I, I, I want to believe that I do, but I mean, it just and, and I just apply my own experience from the, the, the recruiting aspect of it and seeing like the total, like, you know, you can lower the recruiting mission every year all you want and still miss it and, and keep pretending that you're going to somehow turn it around by throwing more, you know, recruiters at the problem. And that's not it. It's um, you talked about people being raised to have a certain belief um, and, and you play that long game. You do what I just said about what, how Breitbart laid it out and you have an entire generation that is no longer seeking to serve or do what's um, in the best interest of the country. And those numbers are starting to outweigh drastically, in my opinion, the ones who would be willing and then on top of that, you also have the uh, the num the amount of service members getting out who don't want their own children to be a part of the military anymore, right? So in that aspect is where I'm talking about. That's where you're going to see a bigger decline because we can talk about what's going on at the Pentagon all we want, right? And that, that's full of people and brass and all this stuff. But if you're no longer filling the ranks, you're no longer putting the people in, in, in the positions to execute your policy, then what are you left with? Well, it gets, it gets to the heart. So I, I did a, flew out to Seattle and did a thing for a, a, a conservative sort of organization out there um, a few months ago. And, and one of the things that, it was the last question I was asked in the Q&A. And I was out there talking about gray zone, logistics and supply chain, all of that. And a guy hit me with a question around that same theme is, what do we do about the fact that the vast majority of the dedicated service members um, don't necessarily say that they want their kids to be a part of this, right? Like the thing they signed up to serve, the flag they put on their, their, their shoulder, the one I wear on my hat, right? Yeah. Like, I don't want my kids to be a part of this. That's what they're saying. And my answer was, it wasn't something I contemplated. I blurted out an answer and ended up being pretty correct, thank God, because it was recorded. Um, but, you know, what I said was this, is that the kind of person that you want, and this is what really shook the room, I said, you know, think about the movie A Few Good Men. Think about that movie. The kind of person that you want in the U.S. military, by and large, is going to be more like the villain of that movie, Nathan Jessup, you know, Colonel Jessup, Jack Nicholson, mm -hmm. the, you know, 
you want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. But like the guy that signs up knowing he could be asked to take a life or give his life is also the type of person who is not going to want to participate in a false meritocracy. When you lower the standards for certain things, when you, and I'm not talking about men versus women or any race or anything, but just the bar is the bar, right? And and the bar for a long time was these time-tested principles of what it took to actually win and then walk into the heart of darkness and walk out with victory. Those type of people are not going to accept a lowering of standards or, or any compromise whatsoever that could cost the life or the mission by saying, well, we have to make this more inclusive or we have to make it more egalitarian or we have to do this, we have to do that. To them, that's complete horseshit. And they're not going to yeah. send their children who are raised the way my children are raised, which is that you win or you lose. You don't cheat to win. You don't uh, break the law to win. You don't do these things to win, but you strive and push yourself every single day. And you surround yourself with people that have that same mentality who want to win the right way simply because they believe more in what they're doing and they're willing to push themselves to the absolute limits of human endurance to do it. When you take that away, that's why you're seeing America's greatest generation of warriors, which is our current, like our tier one guys. And then, yeah. you know, the tier twos, the 82nd, the 101st, uh, the Marine Expeditionary Units. When you talk about all these units of excellence, where excellence is still kind of the standard, those are the guys that are most likely to be saying, I'm not going to tell my fucking kid to, to sign up for this nonsense. Like I'm already, I'm already all in. My, my money's all, my chips are in the pot, right? Like I'm finishing this out. My honor and my commitment demands that I do so. But I'm not going to ask my kids to sign up for this. That's because we've we've eliminated that that meritocratic standard in so many ways. We've watered it down to a place where the warriors don't want to send their kids to fight for a system and for a country that doesn't respect and honor the same like tribal gut level commitment that they have to that system. And it's a prag it's parents making pragmatic choices for what's best for their kids in the moment. And so that that's how a nation finds itself kind of wandering in the wilderness for a generation. That was us post Vietnam. Everybody from Vietnam came home and said, this war was fucked up. We fought it the wrong way. And I'm, I'm sitting in a room with my father-in-law's Vietnam, you know, Vietnam his, his uniform and his accomplishments and whatever. And I look at that and I can absolutely see how a man who put everything on the line and, and, and against the odds survived would potentially tell their children, don't sign up for the same bullshit I signed up for. And that's a hard conversation I have to have with my own kids. You know, I put them in wrestling, I put them in yeah. all of this and they love it and they want to achieve. But my, my son who, who turned 13 here a couple of weeks ago, you know, he said, dad, you know, should, you know, you work a lot with the military, you weren't in the military, um, but should I, is that something for me? On the one hand, I say, son, that's that's your own choice individually. Yeah. On the other hand, I say, here's the drawbacks of where things are and are likely to be when you're making that decision in five, six, eight years, whatever it may be. Um, you have to make that choice for yourself. But a lot of guys are just going to say, Fuck, no, don't do it, son. Yeah. You know, tell their daughter, don't do it. And so the kinds of kids that are raised to be warriors in some way or could be warriors they're selecting against it because of their own parents' experiences. And that's practical. That's your choice as a parent. And that, that, uh, that's where I would, I would love to pick it up there. Cause I know you gotta, you gotta head out. Um, so yeah, let's do that. Let's pick it up there. Uh, try and get it sooner than later. Um, but when we do, it'll be, it'll, it'll be easier moving forward. It's been, it's yeah, been no worries, weird. man. No, I understand. We'll, we'll try and touch <laughs> base after the holidays and I'll, I wish you and your, your, uh, your family a happy Thanksgiving and uh, we'll, we'll make oh, it sure. happy part too, brother. I appreciate you spending some time though. Awesome. Love it. Thank you so much. All right, dude. See ya.